music always gets written about so poorly because whoever is writing it is so obsessed with the mythology around it. When the truth is, it's very similar to an office. Yeah, there's tons of magic, but the day-to-day life of being on tour feels like the show The Office. It's like, you know all these people, and they're really silly, and some are sweet, some are annoying, there's problems. It's all just like one big bit. Jack Antonoff's first hit was the song of 2012. It was called We Are Young, which was back when he was in the band Fun. And listeners, you need to know that I loved this song. Since then, he started the band Bleachers, written dozens more hit songs, and has emerged as one of the most influential music producers in the industry. He's collaborated with everyone, from Lord to Lana Del Rey to Diana Ross, helping some of your favorite artists find their distinctive sounds. He's won eight Grammy Awards, including Producer of the Year in both 2022 and 2023, and he frequently collaborates with Taylor Swift. And as you know, this is the summer of Taylor. All that means that Antonoff is the perfect person to help us understand what's happening in the music industry right now, how changes in streaming and touring have affected artists, and how musical trends mirror broader cultural movements. I'm especially excited that we're going to listen to a few tracks with Antonoff so he can tell us about exactly how they were made. Plus, his surprising argument for why our shared home state of New Jersey is actually one of the most creative places in the country. I'm Charlotte Alter, and this is Person of the Week. You know, people don't think about New Jersey as producing great artists, but actually... New Jersey has produced tons of great artists. Bruce Springsteen, The Four Seasons, Whitney Houston. A lot of people turn their back. I mean, Paul Simon's from New Jersey. Paul Simon's from New Jersey. I was going to say he says he's from Queens, but he's from New Jersey. He's from New Jersey. What do you think about New Jersey producing all these great artists? Yeah, the trick with New Jersey and why it's so inspiring to people who are from there, it is the ultimate landscape of in but out. Hmm. Outside the window of the party. There but not. I mean, literally, think about the amount of scientific energy that fires off of New York City. (laughs) Right. Literal energy. Yeah. So it's the ultimate expression of what's bigger, what's better. And then think about it dying and sort of trickling onto this little place right over the river. That's really emotional and intense. I've been living in Paris for a while over the past little bit. And the biggest thing I've noticed about what it is to be Parisian is, oh, You're from a place where when you were raised, your culture said, we have the best food, we have the best art, we have the best music, we have the best city, we're the top of culture. That is the polar opposite of New Jersey. Because of its proximity to New York City, it has to be (laughs) self-deprecating. And in my opinion, and this is no knock on the Parisians or anyone from big cities, but in my experience, it's not necessarily the recipe for the kind of work that I gravitate to. Mm -hmm. The kind of work that I gravitate to, and it's probably from being New Jersey, is hearing someone dream and struggle. Like a yearning kind of. And get there in a backwards way. Right. So I want to talk a little bit more about growing up. You know, your sister, Rachel Antonoff, is a fashion designer. Were you two always kind of making things together when you were growing up? What was the creative culture like in your house? I mean, we were always really creative. And my father's great guitar player and and both my parents are strange people and creatives in their own way but it is funny that it comes up because today is august 8th which is the day that our younger sister sarah died in 2001 wow Uh, so it's an interesting time to be talking about this but the reason i bring it up is because that happened when i was 18 and rachel was 21 and she had been sick before that Mm -hmm. so it was also a big part of our childhood and The reason why it's connected to our work is because to have something like that loom and then happen in those formative years kind of dismantled the I can't do that or I won't Hmm. do that because there was just such a sort of um, almost like energy towards things. Yeah. Um, You know, in the culture that I grew up in, a lot of people really worked hard in school strived to go to college. Those were things that mattered. And my parents just had a much bigger fish to fry. Mm. And so there was something about that time, you know, I'm 13, 14, 15, Rachel's at those ages too, 
starting to figure yourself out. I was always into music. She was into music too, and always both of us creating. And then right at that time when everyone sort of launches and decides the next chapter of their life, you know, 16, 17, 18, are you going to go to college? Are you going to do this? What are you going to do? In the house, there was such an energy of nothing matters besides what makes you feel alive in the face of death. So that was just a big part of us going for these things. I can imagine that must be really painful. You get to a certain amount of years out and it is less debilitating. Bruce Springsteen has a great quote about it. I don't know if this is a thing he's written or (laughs) this is just something I've heard him say, but he says, if you think about a dirty glass of water that you can't see through, and then you continuously through the years drop clear droplets of water, eventually you'll be able to see through it. Mm -hmm. Dirt doesn't go away. Once again, I don't know if he wrote this. This is the kind of thing that I, uh, he's a very important person in my life that I feel like I could repeat back to him and he might be like, I said that? Yeah. But um, that is the best way of describing grief in the context of my life that I've ever heard, which is that it goes nowhere. But what was once this dirty glass of water that you couldn't even see through, which the manifestation of that might have been panic, me not being able to talk about it, me weeping, it's all still there but you can see through it. So it's, I like to think about it that way. And, you know, you've also spoken about how one result of your family experiencing this horrible tragedy is that you're all really close. And like your parents even sometimes are sleeping on your tour bus and like coming around with you and you guys are such a tight knit family. Close is one word. I would say fused is a better one because I think that speaks to more of the rub in closeness. Yeah. Well, there are not a whole lot of rock stars who have their parents, like, coming around with them all the time. Oh, more than you think. More than you think, really? Yeah, yeah. You know, I was just out with Lana and her dad. He's always there. When I go see Taylor on this tour she's on, I haven't been to one show where both her parents weren't. Annie Clark, who's St. Vincent, I remember we were making Mass Seduction, I remember listening back to um, a really horribly sad song about sort of flirting with suicide in the album, and looking back, and her mom was just on the couch being like, this is beautiful, Annie. <laughs> so there's a lot of parents around. <laughs> so, so much of your music seems to have like a nostalgic quality. What are you nostalgic for? Where is that pointing? I don't think of it as nostalgia. I think of it as yearning. It's yearning for something that I never had. And so uh, for me, that's very front-facing. Okay. I often do it through the lens of the past of what was missing. Hmm. But... There's a looking forward to me in the way I write about something I've never had and will it ever come. And what is that thing? Sometimes it's through the lens of a level of peace. Mm -hmm. A lot of times I write about it through a relationship. Mm -hmm. You know, it's easiest described when I think about the loss of my sister, but it actually existed before that. It's just this weird pull. Sometimes it's about grief, but it's pulling me forward. I don't feel pulled back. I feel pulled forward on a search. Hmm. And sometimes the best way to articulate that is to comment on what was missing in the past now that you can see it clearly. Hmm. I want to zoom in on your career for a second. You got your big break with fun. You've also worked with major artists like Taylor Swift and Lana Del Rey. But your band is Bleachers, which you started in 2013. What is your goal with Bleachers? I mean, the goal is to be in a dialogue with your people. You know, one of the great things that people miss about making music is that it's not even remotely your job to make something for everyone. That becomes a funny thing when you have the kind of mainstream success that I've had. You're only looking for your people. I think about it as like messages in the bottle. You know, you're writing something and then you chuck it out into the world. At one point it was through vinyl. At one point it was through CD or radio. Now it's through streaming. You chuck it out there. And the sort of meditation on the process is just gathering the people who agree and see themselves in it. More with Jack Antonoff on his journey from band member to producer of the year when we come back. So your first big musical hit was We Are Young, which was with Fun 
in 2012. So as the guitarist, you co-wrote this huge anthemic song. It was the number one Billboard single. It was in a Super Bowl ad. It was everywhere. Why do you think this song captured the moment so well? Why was it such a huge hit? Um, it was a time when a lot of bands were becoming interested in music that was based off of programming. And it was kind of one of these like in-between times when people haven't settled on anything so you can kind of do anything. Wait, what do you mean by in-between times? Like in terms of the technology, in terms of the mood, in terms of the musical styles? More like genre and culture. Like there are these times culturally of no man's land. We're in one now. They're wonderful. I'm really excited to be releasing music within it. But that time was one of those things where it's like, before that, there were a lot of rules. The scene I was in was sort of like, this is what you do. This is what this is. This is what that is. Mm -hmm. This is selling out. This is not selling out. It comes from an era of idealism, moving into an era of rules based on that idealism, moving into an era of disappointment because all the rules didn't work. Then moving into what my favorite time period is, which I think we're right now, an era that's more based around discovery, forgiveness, and interest. And all things go together. You know, at the same time that there was a firm way that you had to talk about things and engage in things was also the same time that there was a certain kind of drum sound or drum beat that was God on streaming. Um, X amount of years ago, you couldn't really have a song that reached a really, really, really large amount of people that didn't have some sort of trap backbone to it, mm -hmm. whether that was the literal beat or even just the sound. Um, but yeah, if you think about those like kind of records there's all these just tight rules and so from my point of view where i sit as someone who plays with culture is i just watch these things and kind of play with them at any turn you know there couldn't have been certain records that are very popular now x amount of years ago because our brains were very wrapped up in rules now it's just sort of there's just space for things being less niche so i feel like we're in this just glorious renaissance moment but it's just a time when it's more celebrated to exist outside the lines. It's just an exciting time. You know, in my short life, it's always the same cycle. We go through these times and then maybe in two years, we'll pick a couple things and be like, okay, this is the best of it. Let's roll with this. And then we'll roll with that. And then we'll tighten up again. And then we'll loosen up again. You know, you could clock culture in deep, 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 intense ways, or you could just look at the size of the genes. Yeah. The genes get bigger, the genes get smaller. The genes ride higher, the genes ride lower. You know, this is my visual for culture and making work. Okay, imagine a line moving up and side to side. Like a squiggle. Yeah, like a squiggle, like moving forward, but it's squiggling up and down. Now imagine your work as a straight line moving up. Right. Okay, so you're a straight line. That's your work. You are just chucking the goalpost and you're racing towards it. Culture will squiggle in and out of you. There'll be some times when it just meets and you are just the bell of the ball. And then there'll be some times when it squiggles all the way left or right. And everyone's like, why are they using those drum sounds? Like flop era. <laughs> but then it comes back to you. Right. The worst thing you can do is to chase culture because you'll keep missing it. If you see it go right and you follow it, it's over by the time you get there. Hmm. And so like, you know, five years ago, I felt that the music I was making and the themes I was chasing weren't at the center of culture. And then you do you and and then it sort of comes around and there's more eyes and ears on you and you can't really kind of give a f either way. But that's the visual. If you chase it, you'll miss it. If you do you, then you'll have these moments where you feel seen, where it touches you. And then you'll also have many moments where you don't feel seen. But after some period of time, you realize that that doesn't really have anything to do with what you're making. Have you ever worried that the culture isn't going to come back to you? Uh, not in like a it's not like a deep worry. It's more like it's nice. The deep worry is just sort of wondering when your well dries up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Not how people interact with it. At some point, you just sort of throw your hands up and you kind of realize it's about drilling down to the most honest place of where you're at. But it's also about having an audience. Right. The other visual I think about a lot is if I'm talking to you at a party, we could have a good conversation, we could have a bad conversation, we could have agreement, we could have disagreement, we could have euphoric connection, or we could feel totally disconnected. Mm -hmm. But it's all in the name of conversation. This is how I feel about my audience. If I look away from you, even for one second, we know that feeling at a party when someone looks for something better. Mm. Devastating. You will never trust me again, and you shouldn't. 
And that is what it is to speak to your audience. I will never look away from my audience. They might not always agree with me. They might not love every twist and turn, but I'm not going to look for something better. So you're a producer as well as an artist and a songwriter. I feel like in addition to your musical skills, one of your true gifts is collaboration with artists and helping to bring that kind of magical moment that creates the music. What's the secret to that kind of creatively productive collaboration? How do you know how to elicit creativity from so many different people in so many different contexts? Well, I can only speak to the experiences I've had because there's plenty of people that I can't work with. I don't come into a room and say, here's what we're doing. Here's how we have to do it. Here's what sounds right. Here's the future. I know the future. No one knows the future. The future is this quiet feeling an artist has. Um, I like paying attention to that feeling. I like to be in a room with someone, look at something and not really know how we're going to get there and not even really know how to define it. You know, you can wear all this armor of, oh, it's going to be this meets this and this, and this is what I'm going through. And you could trick yourself into entering the insanely wild process of making an album. But this is what we're going to do. But that's never how it ends up. What you're really doing is you're giving audio to something that you can't describe. If you can describe it, then there's no need to write about it. There's not a lot of records made about food or how good a burger is, you know, because it's like a pretty easily describable feeling, whereas right. love, loss, grief, you know, the sound of the future as you imagine it. That vision of a new place is uh, sometimes too daunting to talk about in the room, but just to have a small team, it's me, someone else, whether it's an artist or a band, Laura, who engineers with me, and that's it. And then we just chip away until we start to hear this thing. And then when you start to hear it, then you can start knowing it. Yeah. So I work well with people who see it that way. I don't work well with people who have, quote unquote, the answers. Let's talk about Out of the Woods, which came out in 2014 on her album, 1989. And it really began your longstanding creative partnership and relationship. And you said on Instagram that you will one day write an essay on the different production I used on this song and how much working on it with Taylor has meant to me. So can you tell us about the production on this? What would that essay have said? Yeah, I never wrote that essay. We just, uh, <laughs> well, I, I, don't, I don't know if I'd be ready to write it now because it launched a very long relationship that hasn't stopped yet mm-hmm. and has been wild growth. People grow or don't grow, but rarely do they sort of grow in complementary directions. And it's been a really rare relationship. So there was a lot of wild stuff used on it. I was in a real kind of glorious kitchen sink phase. So, you know, the song is sort of glued together by these arping Juno 6 keyboards. And then there's just this sort of swirling blend of live drums and program drums. And I've always had like a little chip on my shoulder about the way things sound versus what I liked. And she's the first person who recognized me as a producer. A lot of people are afraid to sign off on something that isn't done by a proven person. I had written lots of songs and produced them, but they would always sort of go somewhere else. So the label or whoever could say, oh, we had this person produce it. Right. And, you know, I put my heart and soul into that song and she said, I love it. Um, you know, when I was cruising out of the woods, that was a phase in my life. And I feel, feel like you could hear it on 1989 and the first Bleachers album a lot where I was really into a level of like chaos that felt like dreaming to me. You know, a lot of the music at that point was coming from my childhood bedroom. I wanted everything to sound brilliant, but I also wanted it to sound like the idea of big rather than big. Like rebellious almost? Not rebellious, more like New Jersey, more like someone dreaming of something being big, leaving space in the records. I still do that a lot. You know, like you don't want to fill all the space. You have to leave room for the listener. I always want my albums and songs to be more wild in someone's memory of what they were than what they actually were. Otherwise, I've left no room for the listener and they're not a part of it. So that's not what I do. So I want to fast forward to Antihero from 2022. 
This is a more recent hit you made with Taylor Swift. It came out in October of last year. How did you approach producing this song differently than Out of the Woods? Both of them use drums and synths, but to different effects. I'm wondering if you can take us through the sort of evolution. Yeah, I mean, it's funny to try to imagine because, like I said, I'm still kind of in process. So it's like I'm in the middle of sort of running through a town and it's like asking me, like, well, what do you feel on that block? It's like, I don't know. I'm I'm going. (laughs) Um, But I, I guess if, you know... Producing a song is like imagining the future and then arriving at the future is funny because it's sort of like it's nothing you thought it would be and everything more. But if I fast forward to Antihero, it's just it's such a different approach. Antihero was mostly built around an OB-8, which is a really weird synthesizer that kind of has a different attitude every time you turn it on. <laughs> and then I kind of I had this Lindrum beat that I made. These are all things I didn't even have when I was producing other woods and I just put a tremolo on it and that became the whole meat and potatoes of the thing. Right. You know, for Antihero, the center of the circle was this, this drum that was, you know, if you take the tremolo off that drum, it's cool, but it's that tremolo is so singular and it's not something when I did that, I had really heard. And then the way the OB-8 is, I always think of it as like a ballpark melody. Mm. Like something someone would play on an old, like an organ in like a baseball stadium. But I heard those two things together and I was just like, damn, that's cool. I had played her that track and I remember we were at my apartment in New York and sometimes she gets this look in her eye where she's like, oh, I'm going in. You know, she goes in in many different ways and is just the greatest writer and vocalist ever. But on that one, I just remember watching her and being like, uh oh, like this is like we like we got a lot of yeah. fun. And and it's that's fun, you know, you know, not everything I do necessarily does she automatically love and there's still a Venn diagram of taste, mm-hmm. but there is that space when we meet up and when we meet up it feels unstoppable. You've said that you make music with your friends. Taylor Swift is your friend, Lana Del Rey is your friend, Annie Clark is your friend. You are one of very few people who've had access to some of like the great artists of our time. What do you think so many of these people have in common? What is that X factor that makes them so good at what they do? Well, I think an artist becoming very massive versus an artist being great are separate things. Yes. So I work with lots of people and I wouldn't be in a room with someone I feel very protective over my space and my time and my mind Mm -hmm. and my work versus the work with other people and also still having a life throughout that. So I'm extremely protective over myself. I wouldn't get in a room with someone unless I just thought in that moment that they were the only thing that ever mattered. So I think that there's a lot of people out there making just brilliant transcendent work. And then I think if you do that, you will have a good life as an artist. Yeah. I think some of those people hit crazy stratospheric places. I've given a lot of thought to why. And at the end of the day, I just sort of return to the studio and make the things. Right. But no matter how massive, big, successful, revered you get, it doesn't change the process because you're doing the same thing, right? Writing songs and producing records, there is no change. Hmm. You know, you brought up Antihero that feels like it's been heard by the whole world, right? process of making that song is the same process of making a song when I was 14 in the room with my friends. I have more skills Mm -hmm. and I can articulate things better, but the bottom line is you are just completely vulnerable in a space trying to create the sound of that thing that you hear in, in your head. So it's hard to think about these people in those terms because my experience with them is arguably like as human as it could possibly get. Right. And it's why I've never succeeded in studios where there's too much ego because I don't see this process to be about that. So I want to talk for a second about the music industry. You know, streaming has obviously totally transformed this entire industry, including how songs sound. It sounds like maybe no, but I'm curious to hear your thoughts. Like, has it changed anything about the way you approach producing these songs? Zero. Zero. If I'm making you dinner and I'm bringing it to your house, I'm not going to cook it based on the basket I bring it in. You know, and the new baskets, um, you know, they suck all the nutrients out. Right. 
the biggest thing I've learned in my time in the music industry is you don't want to have an argument with people who just live in a totally different industry mm-hmm. than you are. Right. A lot of these companies are tech companies. They're not music companies. Yeah. What's going on with touring right now? Jesus Christ. <laughs> I mean, do you really want to go there? Yeah. Touring, basically, the, the, the quickest way I'll put it is this. The insane monopoly that is going on has turned the live music industry into basically a free market to the highest bidder. The reason why that's so destructive is because a show is aspirational. Mm-hmm. A show is a safe space. It should be like a version of a worship center, church or something, right? So if a ticket costs, let's say, $50, let's take bleachers, right? So I set a price for the ticket that I think is so respectful to the audience and to my crew and my people. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to deliver that, right? I can't sell my ticket for my price. It's not possible. I literally can't do it. I mean, I could do it if I were playing in a bar, but not at any sort of level that most of us function at that are doing this for a living. I can turn off dynamic pricing. That's helpful. But it's sad because my point is, if $50 means nothing to you and it means so much to this person, I stand by and will die for this idea that we can all get there. If one person has to work weekends and overtime to get to that show and another person can just buy the ticket like that, whatever it is, once we're in that room, we all paid the same price. We had the same barrier of entry and they're just destroying that. Yeah. You go to a concert right now, you paid $10. The person next to you paid $10,000. The person next to you bought the ticket 20 minutes before the show when the scalpers dumped and paid 10 cents. Mm-hmm. So it's basically like airline pricing, fluctuating markets. The music industry going K-shaped is one of the great sadnesses of my personal life, which is, you know, ostensibly the rich get richer, the poor get poorer, and there's no middle. Artists are easy people to screw. Mm -hmm. I'm very passionate about this stuff. And when we get off this call, I'll go back into the studio and I'll work on my music because that's really what keeps me alive. Um, So we don't all sit around and think about how to make more money or how to do this or how to do that. It's tough. You know, it's just really, really tough. And I really intend on doing my part and hoping that people get sick enough of this. Okay, so uh, what do you think is the song of the summer and how do you know? Well, there's the cultural song of the summer and then there's one's personal song of the summer, right? The summer's funny because it's like, there's a song you put on with your friends. Like, I put on that song from the idol, but I, I do it mostly as a bit. Right. <laughs> that's, that's um, so I don't know if I really want to nominate that, but that one within the context of the conversations that me and my friends have about culture and what's going on, that song has etched its way into a special Gangnam style place in our hearts. But Song of the Summer, uh, I mean, for me, it's pretty wild what's been happening with Cruel Summer. Mm -hmm. It's just crazy. We made that song, it came out in 2019. It was never a single. It was always kind of my and Taylor's favorite. It was always this like, you know, to have that conversation about culture, we were always kind of like, oh, like this is our favorite. And so it's just the most cool, encouraging, weird piece of something coming back around that I have no idea and I'm so grateful. So I think when I look back on this summer and the amount that I've just been hearing that song kind of out at the store and whatnot and my memories of how we made it, that's a selfish one, but that's my answer. Uh, Jack, thank you so much for joining us today. We've learned so much about how you've shaped the music industry and the way you think about music and culture. But now we just want to hear more about some small, everyday things that shape you. So I'm going to ask you some lighthearted, rapid-fire questions where you just say the very first thing that comes to your mind. Okay. Okay. When's the last time you bought an instrument? Yesterday. And what was it? Uh, Benson Echo Rec. It's an echo machine. Okay. Um, when's the last time you were blown away by a vocalist? Um, it, it happens constantly, but I was in the studio with Marin Morris recently and I was just like, Jesus Christ. Wow. And when's the last time you got new glasses? Mm, I buy new glasses all the time and then I fill the prescription and I rarely wear them. I really just vacillate between these ones I'm wearing right now and these thicker black ones. But I bought new glasses probably 10 days ago. Well, I like the ones you're wearing now. They're nice. 
Yeah, I'm into these right now, but I like to have options. Right. When is the last time you met one of your idols? Uh, I got to have correspondence through someone with Jeff Lynn. Wow. So that's the one I would use. But but there's people in my life that every time I see them, even though I know them, you know, I I, I think the concept of idolizing someone could be repulsive or beautiful. Mm-hmm. And so there's people who I very beautifully idolize, which maybe a better word is sort of admire or trust. Uh, and last but certainly not least, when's the last time you had a meal with your family? Last night. What did you have? I had um, a crab cake. <laughs> it was fine. <laughs> If you want to hear more of Jack Antonoff's work, his hits are literally all over the radio. We've also put together a playlist of some of the songs he's written and produced. You can find it on our website. Thank you so much for listening to Person of the Week. If you like what you heard, don't forget to subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. And we'd really love to hear from you. So send us your tips or thoughts on our show to personoftheweek at time.com. I'm Charlotte Alter. See you next week. Person of the Week is hosted by Charlotte Alter. It's produced by Nina Bisbano and India Witkin. Our senior producer is Ursula Summer. Our story editor is Katie Feather. This episode was mixed by Bob Mallory. Our in-studio engineer is Elliot Lowe. Our theme music was composed by Billy Libby. Our fact checker is Joseph Frischmith. Person of the Week is a co-production of Time Studios and Trigger 23. At Time, our executive producers are Mike Beck and Sam Jacobs. At Trigger 23, our executive producers are Mike Mayer, Michael Sugar, and Liam Billingham. Sasha Mathias is the head of audio at Time. You can find us online at time.com slash person of the week and wherever you get your podcasts.